بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. I'm recording this. I'm not sure if I'm gonna make it public. Make it public. I'm gonna record it and then see, inshallah, and take some shura on the issue. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Al ghiba tu ashadu min al zina." Ghiba, slandering someone, is worse than doing zina. So the intent is certainly not to uh, put myself in hellfire. Um, and uh, in that regard, I want to talk about, in a very just frank way, really, about uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, Zaytuna Institute, what changed, what happened over the years, what were the influences. And uh, so I want to start off with, everybody knows that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf over the years, he changed. And, you know, nothing remains in stone. He, you know, if you had talked to me about many issues 20 years ago versus talking to me today, obviously there is a difference. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We all remember the good old days where, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was famous uh, for his speech on the Jal and the New World Order. In fact, uh, he called the Council of Foreign Relations, KFR, Council of For Foreign Relations, so the CK. He used to say it's interesting that how Council of Foreign Relations uh, uh, has seems to have the initials, the acronyms of KFR, which is Kafir. So he used to, you know, this is how he was. This is uh, Hamza Yusuf pre 9-11. And then, you know, the, the changes that occurred that I'm going to talk about. Uh, a person that is growing and learning and trying to improve uh, is better than a person who always sticks to the same opinions. You know, uh, having said that, so let me start by saying that um, the first time I met uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was probably 1994. It was uh, the 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 ISNA conference in Columbus, Ohio, I believe. Dr. Isra Ahmed, our Sheikh, was there um, at that time, and uh, at that time it used to be said that who is copying who is uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf copying Dr. Isra Ahmed. Or is Dr. Isra Ahmed copying Sheikh Hamza Yusuf? Because they had many similar ideas. And so in the room, uh, there were many different... Uh, Dr. Isra Ahmed praised Hamza Yusuf for his Arabic knowledge of Arabic language, so on and so forth. And different things were discussed, which I won't go into right now. But one of the uh, key points that was raised, and I don't think saying this is uh, going against because, you know, these are pu two public figures talking in a private room, but with other uh, awam around them. And uh, and then I was one of the students of Dr. Isra Ahmed Saab at that time, and uh, still consider myself to be. But anyway, one of the questions that Dr. Isra Ahmed raised was, um, what is your opinion about, or something to this nature, what is your opinion about working for Khilafah? And uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, at that time, he answered that he doesn't think much needs to be done because this whole system is going to fall on its own. Then there was a discussion that was taking place after that, okay, but, you know, if you don't have a jama'ah, if you don't have an amir, how the vacuum would be fulfilled, filled up, so on and so forth. I wanted to say something at that time, but Dr. Sir Ahmed Saab stopped me and said, you're in America, you can always contact him and talk to him. Let me talk to him. And so the two continued to talk about other issues, including Islam and social sciences, which they both strongly agreed upon. So that was my first uh, encounter with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. This was a time where he was talking a lot about the Jal and, uh, um, and he was very fiery, very critical. Um, and wasn't hesitant to criticize uh, anyone or anything. 
And so in that sense, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has changed and in, in some ways even improved and grown. I'll give you an example of one aspect of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was very against, in a way, against even creating or making like videos that are like kind of like Islamic sesame street. So like, um, like there's a very famous uh, series called Adam's World, right? And Sheikh Hamza Yusuf really didn't like this idea of Adam's World, like making another Sesame Street type show that's like Islamic or has Islamic themes in it. He was very much against it. So he's very, very hardcore, very, very traditional. And then later on in his life, you know, he changed his opinion about that after dealing with kids and so on and so forth. So Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has grown over time, obviously, as any, anyone has. The other thing about uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is that he was on this trend until 9-11, meaning this is uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf pre-9-11 and then Sheikh Hamza Yusuf post-9-11. So Sheikh Hamza Yusuf uh, post-9-11, uh, a few things happened. Uh, two shiuch that I know of that influenced him. One of them I even took classes with. First one was Umar Abdullah. Uh, Umar Abdullah is a professor at Islamic University of Chicago uh, in Islamic studies. Uh, just in terms of one aspect of his background is that his son is part of the U.S. military. Uh, but Sheikh, uh, so coming from my perspective, uh, you know, I was trained under Dr. Asr Ahmed. So for us, Iqamut al-Deen, establishing the Deen, establishing the Khilafah, working in a Jama'ah, having that type of, you know, uh, living with that brotherhood around you that's in the Jama'ah, uh, and keeping an eye on each other and our Deen and, and being answerable to the Amir. So this is the lifestyle that I'm coming from, okay? And uh, and very much the goal is that we need to revive Islam, and to do that we need an intellectual revival, we need an Islamic cultural revival, we need an Islamic lifestyle revival. And so, uh, you know, hardcore uh, traditional values. And uh, so, so, so that was like the 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 ultimate framework was okay there will be the enforcement of islamic laws in the islamic civilization that's the islamic revival or that's one major dimension of islamic revival along with the revival of social sciences and all that okay so uh sheikh uh, umar abdullah uh who impressed a lot of uh of even uh, students of Isra Ahmed and even impressed me because I loved what he had to say. We actually had a group called Higher Studies Project and, and in that project one of our one of the things that we did is we s spent time with him particularly understanding his view, his thought and his thought was you know you don't really need uh, like a government over people because historically Islam has never had that in his opinion he said, look at Muslims in China, look at Muslims in India, look at Muslims in Africa, look at Muslims in Arabia. They all have different Islams and we'll have a different Islam in America. And it may be an Islam with governance. It may be an Islam without governance, but it'll be organic. It'll be holistic. So just let it be the way it is. And, uh, you know, he had this view that um, we don't need to run after uh or we don't need to okay this view that we don't ne need to run after uh power what we need to do is that will which i totally in that in that framework i agree with that but he was not in favor of establishing khilafa so this was one of the teachers that had a big influence on sheikh Hamza Yusuf. the second teacher who was a very famous teacher of his I don't want to take his name wrong, Sheikh Abdullah. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah. 
he had this opinion or this very interesting concept i think is very very important concept actually but for me i put it in the framework of kind of like al-din the din has to be established and then this framework can work within that and that is that generally we've said there's no peace without justice 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 it's very clear but sheikh abdullah the teacher of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, he came up with something new and interesting, and that is that if you're always looking for justice, like you want justice, I want justice, you want justice, I want justice, I hit you, you hit me back, and it keeps going, it never comes to an end. Some point, somewhere, someone has to say, you know, this is not going to work. You have to say, okay, I forgive. I have to let go. And so this kind of like framework, uh, that he gave was is that this idea that you know there's no peace without justice is not correct there's no peace without forgiveness ultimately you have to forgive be able to be able to move on and you know there's a lot of healing in that it's from a psychological perspective also and i think that's essentially correct so these two ideas that look we're in the west we don't need to worry about uh, having dominance in the negative word or influence in the positive word is, is not necessary. Uh, we need to just um, kind of like uh, present Islam is, is like the, is the highest point. Uh, and uh, we don't need justice. We need to just forgive so we can move on. So these two were definitely components uh, that uh, that affected Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, and and he bought into that. Uh, you, you may agree, you may disagree, you may see wisdom in it, you may not see wisdom in it. I see wisdom in it, and in fact, I like uh, Sheikh Abdullah's example of the different cultures. He says it's like if you have the same water, the, the water is the same, but the river, the the ground on the bottom is of different colors so there's jaded water there is sandy water like the sand there the, the bottom is sandy or it's jaded or or it's stones that are black so as the same water is flowing the color of the river will change as the material on the bottom will change and he said this material on the bottom is the different cultures and islam is like the river and so wherever islam goes it goes with a different color i think that's awesome but this can also be, in my opinion, I'll interject here, this can also be done within the context of Khilafah. So you have khil within the Khilafah, within the implement of Islam, implementation of Islam in its fully, in its full capacity, uh, there will, there will be different colors of Islam within the Islamic empire. And then that's beautiful. So, so these are the two people that influenced uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Now, um, I want to talk about a few other things um, to help you understand. Now, after 9-11, obviously, there was probably a lot of pressure and a lot of things that were going on. Um, so, I want to talk from another perspective. Uh, one of the one of the shayukh that uh, one of our teachers grew up with and and that we kind of grew up with, but not really in that circle, was uh, Basit Bilal, this brother named Basit Bilal. He was um, he was a student of Dr. Sir Ahmed. He was also a friend of uh, Imam Zaid Shakir. Imam Zaid Shakir um, was an imam in Connecticut. He was very popular with his community. Very fiery. He had, he had, he was doing his Islamic studies in Syria and he had a PhD in political science. Amazing brother. He was one of those people that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf at one time said, I would give bayah to Sheikh, uh, uh, Sheikh Zakir, uh, Zaid Shakir. Really an amazing person. Even, I believe, I believe at one time Sheikh Imran Hussein had said, had said something very like powerful about uh, the potential of Imam Zaid Shakir and 
part of it is because he knew the dean and he also had a PhD in political science. As you know that uh, after being an imam in Connecticut, uh, Zaid Shakir, uh, Sheikh Zaid, Zaid Shakir, he went to Zaytuna Institute and started working with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. And it was probably because of Sheikh Hamza's uh, desire to get close to him. And uh, it was probably, um, uh, you know, so, so, the, so Sheikh Hamza, Sheikh Zayn Shakir made that move. Now, prior to this move, the same thing. Sheikh uh, Zayn Shakir was extremely fiery, fiery, extremely revolutionary. I mean, extremely revolutionary. His time in Syria changed that. And so in our annual ijtima, uh, when we had invited uh, Imam Zaid Shakir, and I'm mentioning Imam Zaid Shakir because of his closeness to Hamza Yusuf, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. And uh, so in this we were talking about, you know, what needs to be, what's the, how are we going to move as an ummah, as a, as a jama'ah, as, what do we need to do? What's the agenda? So, Dr. Ahmed, rahmatullahi he believed in a very centralized, there's a jama'ah, there's an amir, there's a shura, and we work on the grassroots movement. And there could be 10, 20, 30 jama'ahs, but every Muslim should be in a jama'ah, and every Muslim should have an amir, and we should work in this context. Imam Zaid Shakir, he said he believes in decentralization. Remember, this is now after 9-11. And uh, right before this time, Imam Zaid Shakir had also written something to the nature of that uh, jihad bin bil qital or jihad with the sword has come to an end or something of this nature. Now, I don't want to say something that's wrong and, and get myself sins. But he had written in favor of Basically, the jihad of the time now is to do jihad of the pen. And that could be right to some degree. Uh, like, to me, this is a form of jihad, what I'm doing with my words, inshallah. Anyway, so Imam Zaid Shakir felt, he made two points there that uh, that were counter to what we were saying. Number one, he said that he felt there needs to be a, a an Islamic, Islam, just each community work on its own in a decentralized way. There should be no centralization of the Muslims. And he felt that that is the best security that we would have. We would, the best security is not to be connected with one another. If we're connected with one another, then we are an easier prey than if we are, uh, not connected with one another. So every community try to grow, try to become stronger on its own. So every masjid basically on its own. Okay, and to not have like a cent a, a, a real cent centralized, uh, not to work in a centralized way with an emir and a shura. Maybe he wasn't against that, but he was he was against being centralized as a nation, as Muslims in America. The other thing he mentioned was, and he gave the example because we had said that look, the Prophet sallallahu had put all his energies into establishing the Deen of Allah. He never used his resources or or any of that to help people in poverty or help the downtrodden or even to help the oppressed and so meaning even in the case of Salman bin Farsi uh, the Prophet didn't mandate anyone to help him he said look help your brother it was an encouragement and the Prophet himself went and you know tried to work hard in the field to help Salman bin Farsi. Whatever good deeds Quran gives us, meaning in terms of resources and giving to the poor and helping, that's at the individual. That's that's get the nafs. You see a poor person, help him. But at the collective level, the Prophet used his resources mostly, if not all, almost always, uh, for the purposes of the deen. This is a, so this. Sheikh uh, Zaid Shakir also disagreed with, and he gave the example that, uh, you know, there's uh, a hadith that the Prophet gave 
uh, you know, s someone dates, give it to the others, give these dates to the others. And this was being done as a charity, by, by given by the Prophet. So, and then that man said, you know, why would I give this to the others? I'm so poor myself and my family needs this. And so the Prophet smiled and let him go. And so this hadith was quoted by uh, Imam Zayd Shakir. And uh, uh, our response, uh, you know, was that, yeah, that happened after Fatah in Mecca, after the conquest of Mecca, this event happened. But these types of events did not happen prior to that. Prior to, after, meaning obviously once the victory is there, the, pro, the Prophet is in charge of Arabia. Now he has to, now he is the, the Khalifa. Now as a Khalifa, he has to take care of the society that is uh, in his care. Okay? And so, so this was the uh, ideas, at least some of the ideas that changed how Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was thinking about things during this time I mean, i'm talking about a time period of maybe 20 years or so now uh you know one of my students uh ashraf ali taught at uh at uh, zaytuna institute and then one of my other students uh uh you know uh mahan mirza he's the dean of zaytuna institute now he studied uh now, both of them were students of Dr. Sir Ahmed, uh, especially Mahan Mirza actually spent time in Pakistan with Dr. Sir Ahmed, um, and then uh, joined Hamza Yusuf, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. So, uh, you know, and then uh, in the, uh, if I can say, in the tradition of Dr. Sir Ahmed, Mahan has kept, you know, tafsir as his uh, main subject that he teaches over there, I think. And then he's also in charge of the relationship between Zaytuna Institute and Berkeley. So the higher academics, he's he's handling a lot of that. Um, and so, so, you know, these two used to be my students. Um, anyway, so, in a lot, you know, Noman Ali Khan was also a student of mine. Uh, you know, when he was initially with Dr. Sir Ahmed, he was a student of ours. And uh, so there's a lot of history there, a lot of history. Um, now let me come to um, the issues that are debated about and how Sheikh Hamza Yusuf sees things from somewhat of a different perspective. The issue of the Black Lives Matters, uh, his main point that I understood was that you know, these social movements, they may have other agendas behind them. And so the point is that if we're going to, you know, we feel uh, empathy for the people that are being killed, but we have to be careful if we're not falling in for another agenda. Meaning is this type of, uh, is this type of uh, conflict being created on purpose? And then we're just in it giving it energy and fuel to further that uh, conflict. So this was his take on the issue of Black Lives Matter. Now, as far as working for Trump, look, the reality is that uh, many great scholars have been advisors to cruel kings and dictators. Um, and sometimes... You know, like, for example, in the case of, again, Dr. Isra Ahmed, Ziaw al-Haq, who was a dictator in Pakistan, uh, asked Isra Ahmed to become part of the shura, <coughs> to, you know, the, the Sharia court shura or something that they had at that time, to how to implement Sharia in, in Pakistan. And Isra Ahmed was part of that for two months, and then he came out and he said, look, this is not going to work. This is just a hoax basically, you know, they come, they meet, and he even talked about, you know, they come, they meet, and nothing's coming out of this. So after two months, he resigned. In the same way, you know, I believe that uh, if there was nonsense going on or some sort of bogus uh, things going on, that Sheikh Hamza would uh, leave at the very least, if not uh, let the people know that this thing is happening. Allahu Alam. Uh, that is the husnuzan I have uh, regarding Sheikh Hamza Yusuf because I do believe he's sincere. 
and I do believe he has sincerity in him, and so does um, uh, Imam Zaid Shakir have sincerity in him. Uh, I believe that because I, I, you know, I, especially Imam Zaid Shakir, I know him uh, very closely. So, um, as far as working with the Trump administration, uh, it is also important to keep in mind that. Uh, the way Sheikh Hamza Yusuf sees this is that it's very easy for Muslims to align with the Democrats right now because the Democrats are quote unquote using the Muslims for votes and uh, have a have to seem to portray that they have a soft spot for Muslims, even though when it comes to uh, so so and then. Even though in terms of values, we are closer to the Christians, the Republican Party. The Democratic Party is mostly atheists and just pluralism and diversity. Whereas the Republican Party, even though it has the evangelical Christians, the hardcore Christians, and you know the, the, the Christian Zionists, they, that's there. But there's also that group of Christians that, are, that could be close to the Muslims. And uh, these are not necessarily, these are not Republicans uh, because of agreeing with evangelical Christians. These are just Republicans because they disagree with the atheists and they disagree with the, the gays and lesbians on the other side. And so they've chosen this side over the other side. And so this is part of the dilemma that, so what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is saying is that, look, we cannot become uh, democratic, uh, just another democratic group. After all, I even asked the question, what has the Democrats ever done for the blacks? And you can expect more or less for us, which is basically nothing. And so, because they're closer to us in morals and they believe in God, there needs to be an attempt made to get closer to them. There needs to be an attempt to not to, to counter a situation where Muslims are always going to vote Democrat and not vote Republican. And so we need to break the ice somehow with some of the Christians on the Republican side to, who, who, who have a good heart and are not necessarily pro-Israel all the time and not pro-Zionists. They just are there because they want, they, because usually, you know, people are, single issue voters it's like that one issue that's the main issue and i'll vote here or there because of that one issue so like one big one for example is is pro-life or pro uh, pro pro-life or pro-abortion if you're for abortion you're a democrat if you're for life not doing abortion you're going to be republican now a lot of christians they don't care about uh the world politics in israel they care about this issue this is their issue and so there is a lot of Christians on the right side that the Muslims need to reach. And I 100% agree with this as a strategy, as a political strategy. I agree with this. So the other thing that uh, about Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is that, you know, uh, he was approached by Hizb al-Tahrir and he was approached by others also on the issue of Khilafah. And uh, he made this statement that became very popular. We need an Islamic state of mind, right? Um, and he has at other times said, and this is probably my biggest, uh, uh, biggest difference of opinion, uh, not at a personal level, but just even at a scholarly level with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, and that is that he doesn't seem to think that it is far upon the Muslims to establish the Khilafah. Even though one of his teachers uh, signed in the Sharia laws uh, in Mauritania. So anyway, so that's, you know, that's that's been my biggest uh, misunderstanding with our Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is that I don't understand if he's not for Khilafah, but at the same time he understands we're at the end of times. And at the same time, 
he understands that Muslims are suffering and that the and he sees that there I don't know what he sees as a solution because I don't know what what could be a solution for Muslims other than a get ready to get off the grid what could be a solution for the Muslims other than get prepared for working learning how to be with the Jama'ah with an Amir so that when the Mahdi comes and if you have not established Khilafah you join the Mahdi and if there is a Khilafah somewhere by that time then the Khilafah can support the Mahdi like يَخْرُجُونَ مِنَ الْخُرَاسَانِ رَعِيَاتُ السُّودِ it's possible the Khilafah would be established by that time that the armies armies will go from where just as themselves no there may be some sort of Khilafah established by that time and uh there is an opinion, uh, which is a longer discussion, that maybe Khilafah will be established before the Mahdi will come. And Allahu A'la, I'm not going to go into details of that. But uh, if we're not going to, uh, you know, what are we going to do more than just have a spiritual r- routine to give meaningfulness to our daily lives? So I'm doing my athkar, I'm doing my daily routines. I'm doing the awrad or whatever. You're doing all that, but then, okay, but what's the solution? Shaulullah Muhaddas Dilbi rahmatullahi has a great influence upon me more and more as I think about it. And when I think about two particular scholars and what they said and bring it together, like bring the one idea of Shaulullah Muhaddas Dilbi together and one idea of Sayyid Nursi Rahmatullah together, when I bring the idea, two, two different ideas from two different people together, it gives me an interesting conclusion. And that is that uh, Sayyid Nursi Rahmatullah said, this is not the time of trying to reach levels of Ihsan, but this is the time where we need to focus on Iman. And he said this while he was seeing the whole Ottoman Empire fall and all of that. And then uh, Shaulullah Muhaddis Dilmi Rahmatullah he very much believed in the re-establishment of an Islamic system, uh, the re-establishment of the Khilafah. Now, the other aspect of Shaulullah is that he also was the first person, first major person to translate Qur'an. So all the translations we see in the world today are because of that one act that he did out of many great acts, historically speaking. So he was the one who, 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 so his relationship with Quran and his wanting the implementation of that Quran with the statement of Sayyid Nursi, to me these, this, plus getting ready for the, uh, the coming of the Jal and, uh, joining, being in a position to join the, and you won't be in a position to join the army of the Mahdi if you're alone. Who can travel all that with their own alone resources? Right, and who can who can take journeys like that dangerous at a time of that at that time? You will have to be in a jamaat to be able to even reach him. Anyway, this is a separate conversation. But uh, my point is that I don't think that. Um, and so my biggest tiff, you can say, with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is that his not accepting. Uh, the importance of Khilafah and working for Khilafah and working in a Jama'ah. And I agree that there needs to be an Islamic state of mind. Uh, otherwise, working for an Islamic state would be useless. Um, and then on that issue also, also, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's working with, um, you know, close to governments and, and never criticizing them and um, kind of like working with the Arab countries and never criticizing them and uh, all these different things. It's possible, uh, knowing Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, that he probably also feels, because he's very much into the social sciences, it's possible that he feels that you know he needs to um, influence the uh the what we call ahlul hal wal aqad the elite of that societies so the if the elite get convinced of islam if the elite get convinced that you know that islam is true and you have to live the islamic lifestyle if the elite get convinced of that then 
um, then you know, then that would affect the whole society. So is it that, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is a sellout? Or is it that he is trying to use his opportunities wisely uh, instead of making 10 people on the ground happy that, yeah, look at these idiots, um, spend time with the idiots so maybe he can learn to respect Islam. And this is very important for any Islamic movement, that a true Islamic movement, a true Islamic movement will only be a movement if it is able to convince the elite of that society to its ideology, to its ideas. An example of that is Khatija and Abu Bakr and Uthman and Talha and Zubair and Ali. These were the, you know, Ali was small, but the rest of them, they were, they were the, the elite of the elite. They were the elite even within Quraysh. Right? So, and, and so, and the Prophet himself was part of, he was Quraysh, he was of the, on the most royal tribe. So, you know, you have to be able to convince the elite of your society to accept your ideas. Otherwise, the change will never come. And so, it is possible that, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is trying to work with the elite in this sense, meaning with this intention. So, it remains to be seen that where all this goes and it remains to be seen and I, I i'm waiting for that day where the old hamza yusuf comes back but with the wisdom that he's attained uh throughout this process and i believe that i've seen glimpses of that old hamza yusuf come out in in sparks you can say and it's there in the background you can see it when he's talking about the Jal and a few other things. But I really wish he comes to the conclusion and to the point and understanding that there is no solution for Muslims other than to turn completely and fully to the Book of Allah and to the Sunnah of the Prophet for a complete solution in the form of a, a rise of a civilization, the rise of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, that cannot be done by a mere seminary. Uh, it needs to be done in the form of a movement, in the form of a lifestyle. So now I want to talk about really the what happened. What were these ideas, the, these two shaykh, especially uh, Sheikh Abdullah. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bay, uh, the teacher of Hamza Yusuf, was uh, working with Sheikh Yusuf Kardawi. Uh, for many, many years, more than a decade, they had been working together, and then he resigned from there, and, uh, and, and, you know, so he borrowed a lot of thoughts, uh, from Sheikh Yusuf Kardawi, but, uh, but using them in the opposite direction, and if I get time, I'll talk about that. The first issue that will be surprising to many people that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf considers a constitutional monarchy to be the best form of government. And he also considers uh, khuruj or rebellion against a Muslim leader to be um, that type of dissent because Sheikh Hamza Yusuf very strongly believes in stability and, and this is the, the tools, the intellectual tools Sheikh Hamza Yusuf uses. He believes in stability before justice. Okay? And so, on the theology of obedience, وَاسْمَعُ uh, وَاطِيُوا uh, Listen and obey, and, and I'll actually quote him on, on these issues um, in a second. So, uh, so, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, for example, he says, and I'm just going to use my notes here <coughs> so I don't misquote him. Muslims today see themselves as victims. Victimization is a defeatist mentality. It is the mentality of the powerless. Muslims never really had a mentality of victimization. From a metaphysical perspective, which always, which is, al is always the first and primary perspective of Muslim, there can be no victims. We all believe that suffering has a redemptive value. So what he's saying is that if you are living under oppression, it's okay because it has a redemptive, redemptive value. It will wash away your sins. 
But this is not all he's saying. He's saying that Muslims have become victims, and because we have become victims, this is why we want social justice, and this is this is why we want Islam, and this is why there are Islamist groups like the Ikhwan, like the Hizb al-Tahrir, like Jamaat Islami, like Tanzim Islami, and Al-Murabitun, and so many others who want and talk about Khilafah, but he sees that as... Uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf sees this and he's talked about this extensively. He has said that this is just a Marxist, uh, a Marxist, uh, you know, utopian. And, and to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, wanting an Islamic state is the same as, is basically a Marxist utopian way of viewing the world. And Sheikh Hamza Yusuf will say, look, there is no pure justice. Even within the Khilafah, there will be no pure justice. But, you know, because you're victims, you're seeking this utopia. So this is how he sees it, okay? So because of this, he is against all Islamists. And, you know, unfortunately, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, to me, I say this unfortunately, because whether you agree or disagree, right, it's not good to bash other people, especially if they're Muslims, and especially if they have high goals. Like the way he's bashed uh, his Tahrir, I think, has been completely unfair. And uh, <clears throat> And so anyway, let me read what, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's opinion is about uh, the Arab Spring that will make out they, that will make things clear, and his view about Islamists will make things clear. And this quote of his: "That's why our ulama traditionally were opposed to revolution." What Sheikh Hamza Yusuf forgets here is that who was the first revolution, revolutionary in our Islamic history was Hussein radiAllahu anhu. He went against the grain of society and stood up, and then after that. Other people in the family of the Prophet ﷺ were the only people who stood up to the Umayyad of that time. And uh, all the way till Imam Muhanif and Imam Malik supported Nafs al Zakiyah in his revolution. In fact, uh, Imam Muhanif has been quoted to have said, today is like the Battle of Badr, even though Abdullah, uh, and his name was Abdullah bin Muhammad, and he was from the family of the Prophet, and he did an uprising against the Umayyads, and he was supported by Imam Malik, his fatwa. لا بيع في جبر. There's no bayar. There's no compulsion in giving allegiance. Uh, so Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has uh, overlooked uh, this aspect of Islamic history that in the early period of Islam uh, there were uprisings, but then after that they were not. But there was a difference, and that is that these uh, these kings they were Muslim kings, and the courts were still ruling according to the Sharia. And, uh, you know, the Islamic lifestyle was completely and fully maintained. And also, what's happening in politics didn't affect person day to day. You know, whereas today, politics is much more in our face and much more affecting us on a daily basis. And the level of kufr that we have now and the level of, of haram things we have around us now and the level of injustice we have now has never been there. So... I think looking at the past and making a blanket statement like that, I think was a mistake. This is why our ulama traditionally were opposed to revolution, not because they thought oppression was wrong or they weren't trying to keep the oppressors or or they were trying to keep they weren't or they were trying to keep oppressors in power. They saw it from a medical a, a metaphysical perspective, first and foremost. And that is that it is an ibtila from Allah. If you remove metaphysics, in the, uh, then the world makes so, no sense at all. You can tear it all down. Then you can tear everything down. Who is you can tear everything down? This is the Islamists who want Khilafah. Okay? So, uh, they want, and, and speaking about organizations like Tanzim Islami, Hizb uh, al Al Murabitun, or anyone who want Al Ikhwan Al Muslimin, and totally dismissing the fact that his own sheikh was a student of Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, which I'll be talking about this relationship in a little bit. But they want the ideal world. They want to eliminate evil. This is their goal, to create paradise on earth, to create a Marxist dream to create paradise on earth. Once we establish equality on earth, right? And so for him, it was uh, a very simple formula. Uh, you know, Islamists, uh, these are people who don't have the Islamic view of 
of of suffering. They don't have the Islamic view of obedience to the leadership. Um, these people are going to cause instability. Our ulama were against creating instability. This is all true in in general, uh, just not true in 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 the in. You know what's interesting is that. Um, and, and I'll talk about fiqh al uh, which is the fiqh of the reality of the situation, which you're able to say in fiqh al is that how the situation of today is different from yesterday. And therefore, because it's different, therefore the same fatwa will not apply. So if someone can prove, okay, that today is different in, in, in this, this, this key respect, therefore the fatwa of the past will not apply anyway, okay? And, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and his teacher Sheikh Abdullah went to such a point that in uh, one of their uh, forums that they uh, created, uh, which I'll tell you what that is, um, they had a conference, and this is under the uh, forum of Sheikh Abdullah and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Um, they had a forum in which they talked about a manuscript, a misread or misprint of Imam Nitaimiyah's one of his writings. And use that as to make this point. So, you know, they, there were the Mongols and then there were Muslims on one side and they were fighting. And then there were the Muslims who were kind of like on the side of the Mongols. And so, uh, what is, uh, he is, so, so basically this new way of reading and manuscript mistake shows that Imam Nitimiya did not say or did not want to fight against these Muslims who were on the side of Mongols, but rather you deal with them. Okay, but the point is, he went to that place where these Mongols were to hold this forum and made this a point to 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 make the point that you cannot go against the obedience of those that are in authority. Okay, uh, we do not accept any rebe rebellion against our leaders in our public affairs, even if they are oppressive. That is the aqidah of the Muslims. If you are to tell me we have to go out against the government and our salaf said and uh, and they all agree even if they are oppressive why did they put that there and why did the prophet say even if they're oppressive right so because he knew people would say but uh, would he knew what the people would say because he knew people would say but they have oppressed us because he knew people would say, "People, uh, we've been oppressed, therefore we need a rebellion. Now, this is a very important point. That obviously, you don't stand up with an uh, uprising knowing that you're going to be defeated. That's going to just cause chaos. This is the fatwa of Imam Bu Hanifa, by the way, which I don't think Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is aware of. The fatwa of Imam Bu Hanifa after this event of Nafsul Zakiya, Muhammad bin Abdullah happened, and the way he was crushed, Imam Bu Hanifa gave a fatwa, that you only allow an uprising, meaning stand up against the government, only when you feel you have enough numbers. As the Qur'an also says, if you are strong, then one will overcome two, and if you're weak, one will overcome ten. So there has to be a critical number, and there has to be a critical mass that is with you. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion that they have in these forms about what is khuruj, what is rebellion, is rebellion with the tongue, is it with, you know, physically doing something. Uh, and so, uh, the question is purely predicated, in, 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 Ham, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was asked this question about uh, modern democracies. So he responded, the question is purely predicated on the context that they're living in. In a place like Singapore where Muslims have access to the political system, it is very important that they engage in it. Same in the United States and other places. So this is what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf believed is that you engage in the current system and you don't go against the current system. You cannot go, you cannot try to do a rebellion, a revolution, bring out Khilafah. This is un-Islamic according to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Okay. So, talking about constitutional monarchy, which is according to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, the best form of uh, government. Okay. Kings do not have the, the, suscept the susceptibility. Sorry, I have dyslexia, so... The kings do not have susceptibility, susceptibility for corruption. Uh, 
and a poor person that a poor person or even a rich person because a king has everything kings are not hungry they have everything so they do not need anything if a king is good he will raise his children to be good we have a great example in morocco the king in morocco comes from a good well esteemed and clean family he loves his people and love and the people love him i've seen the same thing with the al saud family but they are often surrounded by bad people so this again uh the idea that you have to obey the, those that are in authority which is why he is in good books in fact over here i'll mention something that sheikh yusuf qardawi has been known to be with the ikhwan supporting the ikhwan and one of the things that sheikh yusuf qardawi believes in is hurriya qabla sharia hurriya means freedom so if you don't have freedom you're not going to have sharia sharia so you have to bring sharia you have to bring hurriya freedom so that then you can allow the people to bring sharia because then the people have a voice and they'll be, but so even people have gone against this idea of Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, but there's a certain logic to it, which is similar to, you know, you got to have some stability before you bring in uh, the, the new system, so to say, kind of similar to that. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'll share with you something very interesting. When George Bush was going to uh, do September, uh, sorry, uh, after September 9th, after September 11th, sorry, when George Bush was going to go... Um, to Afghanistan. He initially named <clears throat> this uh, war, this operation, uh, Infinite uh, uh, Justice. And uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf uh, convinced him, look, in, you know, infinity is like God and, and the, uh, the Muslims will not like this. And so George Bush changed the uh, name of the operation to enduring uh justice okay enduring justice uh the same thing happened when uh because uh sheikh hamza yusuf's teacher sheikh abdullah has been in politics all his life he's been in, in charge of mauritania's postal office their judiciary their islamic uh the the sharia system all that when he one day met uh muammar Gaddafi on behalf of the uh president Instead of telling him, don't do injustice to your people or bring Islamic law, he tried to convince him not to become a, 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 a what we call Qur'aniyun, a person who denies the entire corpus of hadith and was trying to convince him and convinced him probably that not to deny the entire corpus of hadith. So like this, uh, they both have this kind of like, if we meet a leader, we'll fix his aqidah kind of thing. Oh, or maybe this is just a random event, but there is, uh, this is just interesting to keep in mind. When the Arab Spring happened, um, he said a lot of things pro Arab Spring. So obviously people felt that's good, but his reasonings for it became clear when he made this statement. The lack of an ideology for me is the mo most refreshing aspect of this uprising. Okay, the lack of it, meaning the fact that there is no, Islam is not in the middle of it. Okay, the, the stale rhetoric of Islam is the solution that has marked countless demonstrations for decades is absent. Islam is not a political ideology and hence does not offer a political solution per se. But basic morality and politics is the solution, according to him. Most Muslims would be content living under Finnish or Swedish forms of government with a few adjustments to the sexual liberties in those countries and, uh, and, and feel as if it were the time of Salahuddin. So this is what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf said and this is his opinion. So his opinion is Islam it doesn't have anything to do with politics and, uh, and uh, that... Um, any of the other forms of government with as long as they're good people moral people it'll be like islam okay and then uh let me also and in 2013 uh there were some signatories that uh wanted change in uae they presented it to the government some group of people it's a very long discussion you can look this up but it was uh sheikh hamza's teacher counter to Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, who uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bay, his fatwas were used 
as a way to arrest them and to take away citizenship from, I think, about 14 of them and to uh, try and kill on terrorism charges, two of them, because they spoke out against the government. And, and, and even though, to be just and fair, in political science, um, if you read political science, they will tell you the best form of government is a benevolent monarch. But here, what is happening is, is that this idea of the benevolent monarch is being misused by oppressive monarchs. And these fatwas are being, these fatwas that are being given out and kind of like uh, court, being courted uh, are, are, are being misused. And people are actually being killed because now that you have uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and uh, Sheikh Abdullah uh, kind of like courting and saying, yeah, you know, they should uh, follow you to wherever you take them, even if it means, um, even if it means to bring uh, a Satanist to uh, sing songs for us. So I just want to read to you a paragraph about this situation where Yusuf Qardawi, Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, uh, was being uh, balanced by other, uh, by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Sheikh Abdullah, uh, so that they can. Uh, you know, kind of like have a counter to the Arab Spring in UAE. And so here, considering these contexts, what seems most likely is that UAE realized that its counter-revolutionary project would need not just hard power, but soft power too, in seeking to set up a counter-authority to Al-Qardawi, the Mujtahid, the, the Mujtahid long regarded as religious authority of the Muslim Brotherhood, who wants their people who want Islam, who have been based in Qatar since 1960s, the UAE seems to have successfully courted his uh, his deputy, meaning Yusuf Qardawi's deputy, Sheikh Abdullah, who's the teacher of uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya. This view is further vindicated given that UAE established the Emirates Fatwa Council in 2018, which chair, which was chaired by Bin Bayi and counts Hamza Yusuf as one of its members. The degree to which the sheikhs seem to have thrown their influence behind the counter-revolutionary project was represented in the last forum in the, uh, when the current Grand Mufti of Egypt, uh, Shaki uh, Alam, who signed off on the death orders of Rabia protesters was awarded for his work in order to promote global peace and combat extremist ideologies. Even though recently uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has had kind of like a fallout with uh, Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey, I won't go into the details of that right now, the, he, he, he says, okay, uh, the irony is that the president Erdogan is not an, an Islamist. He's not somebody who wants Islam. This is who's saying this. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is saying this. The irony is that, um, uh, you know, he wrote, uh, you, 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 those of you who know that uh, uh, Sandala is the uh, publication, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's official publication, this is from there. The irony is that President Erdogan is not the Islamist that Western media portray him to be. He's not the Islamist that they portray him to be. He is a, the secular head of a nation. His party has helped Turkey move away from the French lassism towards a more American model of secular secularism. So this is um, so whatever positive things Hamza Yusuf has said about Turkey is in the context of knowing that or understanding that Erdogan is a secular person, and also Muslims should be careful that when these secular people are saying things that sound Islamic to us, they usually have their own agendas or they're catering to the emotions of the people. And we have to be careful of that. So those are some things that I wanted to share with you about Sheikh Hamza's uh, political views about uh, going against the authority, going against the authority of the kings, going against, um, and how he's dead strong and, and has made it his agenda, just like the West to go against what we can call Islamists, uh, uh, Muslim groups, uh, and especially the way he has bashed Hezbo uh, I think has from even from an Islamic perspective, the way he's done it uh, has been uh, regretful. It's been a disappointment. 
And then, you know, uh, then Sheikh Hamza Yusuf also has his fiqhi issues, right? So he has the Qibla in a different direction from the rest of the um, people. And, uh, you know, the hijab issue uh, where he's talked about, uh, and I don't want to go into that right now, but everybody, those who know, know. And um, and and how he's, he's dead against the idea of Islamic government and uh, of a... Of, and that of a modern Islamic government. And then, I, you know, when I say modern Islamic government, I don't mean like something new, different from Umar ibn Khattab or the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu I just mean that obviously there will be, um, uh, the, the government structures will be somewhat different because we have, before there was one teacher and he was a, a university. Now you have a university. So there are some, you know, slight differences. Um so the, the social structures are different in, in the time that we live in. Uh, technology is also different, but I don't really see, you know, technology can be, uh, is, is not a big issue in terms of uh, the ideology, right? And so, um, and then, uh, you know, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has created a space for himself, uh, even in the local area. Uh, when I was invited uh, about like 20 years, 25 years ago, I was once invited to... Um, to Fresno, California, in some summer camp, and uh, I was invited by members of Tanzim Islami um, about again twenty years ago or so um, to I think it was Santa Clara, and that's where Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was, or close to that area, I believe. Um, and so I got a, it was interesting to see the um, how the local community, the local Muslim community, was responding to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and and and. Um, Anyway, so I'll just end at this. Um, so here are some of the points to consider. Uh, my only personal regret and disappointment is how he has tried to, um, and there's so much to talk about in this, because uh, the ideas that they're using to go against the Islamists are, this, are the ideas that Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi created, in a sense started and initiated to actually create a space for Islam and to talk about Khilaf and talk about Iqamatuddin and talk about the establishment of Islam and and, and those same fiqhi tools um, are being now used to um, to go to being used by uh, in in the Arab world uh, to to counter the idea that there should be an Islamic government and uh, and so it's to me um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf should have been more open to Islamists and Islamic groups. And he should have sat down with uh, Sheikh Safar Hawali or Sheikh Suleiman Awda. Or he should have sat down with uh, Dr. Isra Ahmed and others uh, like them, uh, Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi. Um, others like them to actually have a better understanding than what he did of the Islamists. Islamists don't want Islam because they want a utopian world. Far from it. Uh, Muslims want uh, Islam so that number one we can establish the will of Allah on earth um, you know uh, establish my deen and have no dispute about it so uh, this is a longer conversation but to say that Islam has no space in politics as he has suggested and that uh, the current forms of monarchies uh, have been kind of supported by him indirectly and people have died because of that indirectly um, is a regrettable situation I think is the most sad part of this but on the other hand I'll say that uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf um, because uh, he you know because he is not criticizing Final remarks, even though I believe in the end, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf uh, is going to do the right thing, inshallah. But I think he's put himself in a very, very dangerous spot to be used by the, the Jali forces 
and to be used by these uh, by the forces that would uh, you know when you say you want stability and not revolution you're basically saying you want the status quo and the status quo has bought into the Dijali system and so you're saying that you are basically for the status quo and I fear I fear and uh, I have no malice or I'm not using Sheikh Hamza's name to get fame it is disappointing but it is fearful but at the same time I love Sheikh Hamza so much that I trust inshallah that he will make the right decision eventually and one of the ways that can happen is if people understand where he's coming from what his thinking is and challenge him on it and to question him on it and uh, to raise a good question that makes him think deep and hard and makes him realize that he is falling for the very thing that he is trying to uh, he's falling for the status quo Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas.